Center for Transportation Studies here at Portland State University. And today we're very honored to welcome Professor Michael Walton from the University of Texas. Um, he has a bachelor's degree from Virginia Military Institute and master's and PhDs from North Carolina State University. And there are too many uh, publications and honors and committee chairmanships to mention, but he's absolutely a leader in our nation's uh, transportation research and education uh, communities. And he currently serves as the chair of the board of directors of ITS America. And he's here today to talk about the national ITS program plan for the next 10 years. And if I missed anything, please uh, correct me. And thanks, thanks for joining us today. Rob, thank you very much. Indeed, it is a privilege to be here at Portland State. Uh, Portland seems like a second home to me. I do have family here, and I have so many dear friends, so I'm delighted to be on campus, and I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. And particularly talk about a topic that I'm very excited about. I think there is a unique opportunity, and particularly for those of you who are finishing up uh, one phase of, of the start of your career, there are terrific opportunities that will be uh, emerging in the near future I regret that uh, I won't be uh, around to participate in such a, some of the exciting uh, ventures that you'll see, but it truly is a unique position, and your timing is absolutely perfect. Now, of course, we say this story every year, so it's been going on for 20 years, but it's, it truly is a wonderful opportunity. The topic that I'd like to share with you uh, is indeed uh, uh, the development activity that uh, was put together or created in concert with the U.S. Department of Transportation, with the ITS community, and within the Department of Transportation at the federal level. It was, it, the group is called the Joint Program Office, which is the focal point, if you will, for all the ITS activities at the federal level, at the federal government level. And then uh, ITS America, as many of you know, is an organization that that essentially provides a forum of all or as many as, as possible stakeholders to come together and talk about what the future might be. While ITS America and the ITS program is probably about a decade old, it's still very much in the infancy stage and, and what we'd like to talk about is what we see now is the next 10 years. 10 years old, ITS program beginning to emerge, it was created, as you know, in, in 1991, formally, with the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, and then continued in T21, the current authorization that we are operating under, transportation authorization. The reauthorization of T21 is underway now, and we, uh, what I'm sharing with you was put together as an effort to try and suggest what the priorities might be for that legislation as well, is trying to create a vision for the next 10 years. So that's a little bit of the background that I, I wanted to share with you. And this whole exercise uh, that, that uh, took several months to pull together did, in fact, bring the various stakeholder groups or representative various stakeholder groups together. Started off with the crea creation of a vision statement like most uh, uh, strategic planning initiatives or business planning initiatives, and you can you can see there by uh, that we're trying to focus on some of the key words that you would expect to find in a transportation system vision statement. Trying to bring those together in some coherent fashion: safe, secure, efficient, economical, movement of goods and people, customer satisfaction, compatible with environmental concerns essentially a well-integrated universal transportation system. In continuing that, the future system will be managed and operated as a seamless end-to-end -end intermodal passenger travel and intermodal freight. Typically, when we talk about intermodal, um, the community essentially focuses on, on their own particular bias and their, only, uh, their particular focus freight or passenger. So in essence, to make sure that it was not construed to be just passenger or just freight, we wanted to make absolutely clear uh, the vision statement that involved both. Uh, we're also focusing on public sector and private sector. There are unique business models that will unfold, and I'll keep using that 
term, and I apologize if I overstate it, but we don't know today what the business models of tomorrow are going to look like for ITS systems. It's changing dramatically. And, in fact, we're, we have a few examples that I might share with you as we go through of business models that are beginning to evolve. In other words, legitimate, sound business ventures that will help ITS unfold. And it's, there are a number of institutional issues and other things that we can talk about. And I do want to spend some time at the end where we can, we can have a dialogue. Future systems will be secure, obviously, customer-oriented, as we talked about, performance-driven, another key phrase that shows up time and time again. We found in the early stages of ITS that many of the issues were institutionally oriented. So in essence, we are looking at, if not an evolution, a revolution of some of the institutional arrangements that we have in place to truly bring about some of the business models and relationships of the future. So. Those, those are uh, pop up in our statements as well. Now, goal statements. Obviously, safety is at the forefront of all the ITS initiatives. So safety clearly is important uh, not only to society, but it's also important to Congress. When we're looking at reauthorization issues and we're looking at what, what will drive or help create uh, the foundation for ITS funding and support, safety is important. Now, our safety goal says to reduce transportation-related fatalities by 15 percent, or five to 7,000 fatalities a year. Okay, that, there was a big argument, you know, let's just say an active discussion about what that should be. How many, how many fatalities do we have on our, our highway system, for example? How many fatalities do we have a year? Any idea? I know you know. How many? 100,000? 100, 100, well, no. U.S. wide. Oh. Nationwide. How many highway fatalities do we have? All right. It's on the order of 43,000, it's beginning to increase again. That's 43,000. Now, we're talking about a 15 percent reduction or five to 7,000. Is that a realistic target? Maybe. Well, there are some countries that say we're going to have, our vision is zero fatalities. Zero. Is that realistic? Should we have had a goal that said that at the end of 10 years we would have, instead of a reduction of 15 percent, we were going to, would create a vision of going to zero? Probably not, right? This probably does not make sense to think that within a 10-year horizon, 20-year horizon, maybe in your lifetime, probably not mine, that we can reach that vision zero statement. But Sweden, for example, has a clear vision that they want no fatalities on their highway system, and that's their goal, that's their vision, and they're working that way. Other countries like uh, New Zealand, true, both are, let's just say New Zealand, for example, they, don't, they make investments on the basis of a benefit-cost analysis. That benefit-cost ratio has to be three or four before they can make an investment. Well, they value a life at an exceptionally high number. So what do you think they're investing in? Safety-related projects. So any place where they've had a fatality or if they make an estimate of what, what, the, what the crash incident had been over a period of time, that drives their investment stream. So they're working toward that same vision. In a way, 5 to 15 percent, 5 to, Another way to think about this fatality issue on our highway system, 43,000, uh, it's not a very attractive uh, image, but that's the equivalent of a 737 crashing every single day. Now, if we had that, I mean, if you think about that just for a moment, now, would we accept that? Absolutely not. I hate to use 737. Boeing would be out of business, and that's probably not fair to <laughs> <laughs> But the fact is you get the idea. It wouldn't be acceptable to us, so we would, we would do something about it, right? But our highway system out there in a desegregative fashion, which would, is, has that experience. So this safety issue was not taken lightly. I mean, it was, it was, you can see the complexity behind it, but there's a rich opportunity there. We'll talk more about that later. Security, obviously, uh, security was on the list, but it was not on, uh, in the discussion, this was on the list. Yes? On the 15% microphone, on the 
percent. Did they, uh, the people who came up with that number, look at a correction factor? And that that uh, seems to be a pretty, uh, pretty optimistic correction factor for, for fatalities. It is. It's a very ambitious number in a 10-year period. I, when we get into some of the other themes and some of the other uh, programmatic areas, we're going to come back to safety again, and you'll see what's driving that. But yes, it is very ambitious. Um, but they did not, you know, in the discussion, didn't want to set the bar too low. Wanted to put it higher. There's also another, uh, another uh, similar goal that had been established by the federal government in the trucking industry, about 5,000 uh, deaths within a within a 10-year period. But we'll we'll come back to that. All right, security. Now, this was de developed before 9-11. I mean, that was on the list of priority areas before 9-11. But again, it's been, of course, uh, timely to recognize that that is a gold area. We all wish to travel in a safe and secure fashion, of course. So we looked at what, what we could do to protect it against any sort of uh, attack or then be able to respond effectively so we could continue to move goods and people. Efficiency and economy, the target was to create something that would save a, uh, an environment that would save $20 billion per year by enhancing throughput and capacity. And that's not just fuel savings, that is time savings, the effect of congestion, the whole, the whole uh, complex interaction. Mobility and access, uh, universally available information, we talked some about that at, uh, at the meeting yesterday, and you're going to hear a lot more about this, the impact that information can have, and we all have some understanding about that. Energy and environment is another one of the goal statement areas, and hopefully to save a minimum of a billion gallons of, of fuel, whatever fuel, it says gasoline here, but fuel each year, and to reduce emissions uh, in proportion to that. So. Those are the five sort of goal statement areas that reflect on the initial vision statement. And by the way, there is a document that, uh, that is on ITS America's website where you can access uh, the full report as well as other brief reports. And uh, this PowerPoint presentation is here and available uh, through Rob. Now let's talk about some of the theme areas, if you will, and the themes... Essentially, we divided into the ones that were programmatic and then those that would enable, if you will, uh, the vision or enable the goals. The programmatic or outcome-oriented uh, areas. And essentially, we're going to speak to those separately. Hopefully, some address the safety issue in each one of the goals. Then there are those that are enabling, which are viewed as facilitating the achievement of, of our goal statement and then our vision. So we broke it, felt that there were cross-cutting relationships that need to, need to be put in place. Now, programmatic, the ones that we see are outcome-oriented. And these are some that you, you perhaps uh, are very familiar with. There are perhaps there are others that are, are new. The integrated network of transportation information is the whole notion of the infrastructure and telematics being merged together. We talked a lot about that yesterday at uh, ITS Oregon. There's a whole notion of activity that talks about how we can use information more effectively. And we can I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Secondly, the advanced crash avoidance technologies. These are technologies, many of which are available now, are being, uh, uh, they're available to a large extent as options. We've experimented with them in many cases. And we see that there are, there's a rich opportunity of bringing those together. So I'll show you some examples of those. Automatic crash and incident detection, notification, and response. The whole notion of telemedicine and some other ideas that come in and pick up there. You know, the OnStars and the other types of initiatives fly in that arena as well. Rich opportunities. Advanced transportation management all the way up to automated systems. And then Homeland Security which was indeed uh, added as Homeland Security after 9-11. After now, those were the programmatic, the cross-cutting or enabling ones, the ones that facilitate these things to happen. There is a 
cultural change that is taking place and needs to take place when we think about traditional accessibility issues and this transportation system management and operations there's a whole whole change that's taking place it's a it's a very a dynamic environment and one that we think through these the cultural change and the way in which we look at uh, accessibility issues and our our requirements we begin to look at the interface of information and choice. Next, the public sector roles, relationship, and funding. <clears throat> that whole nature is changing dramatically, too. We'll talk a little more about each one of these. And then federal policies and initiatives to achieve the private sector product development. That's in there because there is a recognition that we need to create new business opportunities, not more government, necessarily, but to create an environment where the private sector sees opportunities and can move quickly in to provide those services. Services to be bought by the consumer, possibly services that might be uh, purchased by the by government, but basically either B to G, B to C, or B to B type of operations. And then human factors. And the human factors is, is another, that's an area that is rich for mining and research activities. We know little about some of the interface with technology. And, you know, the more we learn about technology and the interface, the more we understand what we, the more we realize we don't know. So the theme structure with each of these areas, the programmatic and the enabling themes and the activities under each, then we talked about uh, how we could structure these themes in a statement of current status and opportunities, the benefits that might be derived, and the benefits area is one that comes up time and time again. Uh, even during the reauthorization activity that's going on now, we're continually being asked about what are the benefits from the investments that we're making in ITS. Show me the benefits. What bang am I getting for our investment? And in fact, it's even more specific than that. Individual states are asking, for example, Oregon might ask, I understand what the benefit was in New York from a certain type of investment in ITS, but what would it mean in Oregon? Because Oregon is not New York. There are different states, different regions, different attitudes. What can we expect in Oregon? So there's a great deal of, uh, that, of work that needs to be done. Even though we do not have a fully integrated ITS program yet, and in fact it's hard to realize some of the benefits until you have more of deployment in place. The next is opportunities and challenges to be overcome. Clearly there are a number of those. We talked about some and we'll come back and visit that. And then the whole notion of the research activity program and the institutional changing actions that might be brought about. Now let's talk about some of these particular items. The NT, and we need a better name for this, this integrated network of transportation information is can is confusing, it's a tongue twister, and no one, everybody scratches it, what are you talking about? So there's a contest um, underway, and sometime in the future someone's going to come up with a name and they get to serve on twice the many committees that they served on before if they're a winner. But the activity does suggest that we are trying to integrate public sector activity, information gathering, the various business opportunities that are beginning to emerge, the whole notion of vehicle, highway interface again, and I mentioned yesterday to the <clears throat> at ITS Oregon the whole idea of trying to use the vehicles more and the sensors that the vehicles have on board and the new sensors that are possible to be able to communicate vehicle to vehicle as well as vehicle to infrastructure. I'll give you an example. It's one that's, that helps me when I think about you know, what we're dealing with. The notion of the infrastructure, at least at the federal level, is the idea that we would place in the increasing number of sensors, uh, either remote sensing or active location sensors in the infrastructure where we would continually pick up data and collect it, and through an integrated database system come out and analysis, come out with, with information that would be useful to us. We're doing that now in incident management. We're doing in a whole host of other areas. But what about the vehicles? 
The vehicles themselves today have over 200 and some sensors on board. You see it all the time. Dashboards providing you with all sorts of information. And the sensors on advanced vehicles are even getting more sophisticated. Tire pressure, all sorts of information that's available to you. It is possible now. In fact, the vehicle manufacturers are anxious to be a part in this whole integrated network system so that they can be communicating vehicle to vehicle as well, rather than having to deploy or place sensors throughout the network, maybe there's strategic locations and interfaces, but using vehicles more as the information gathering device and then disseminating that information broadly. whole host of interesting issues, but let's just take one example. The notion of two vehicles traveling in opposite directions, and I used this one yesterday. One vehicle coming, uh, again, they're approaching one another, obviously in their respective lanes, and then one of them communicates to the other, uh, there's black ice ahead. How do they get that information? Obviously, they picked that up from the tire and the pavement interaction. The relationship was such that you know that certain skid resistance and with, with enough information, the onboard computer suggests what, those, what might have caused that reaction and then transmitting that intelligence to a vehicle who then happens to be headed in that direction. You can think of all the variations and all the types of situations where that type of information would be useful to you. That's what we're talking about. Now, for us to have sensors throughout the network that would convey that same information might be expensive to do. But if there's some way to take advantage of the vehicles, some say as probes, but more active data information gathering systems and then con working with the network and conveying that, all of a sudden a rich array of opportunities begin to come in your own mind. That's what we're talking about to a, to a large extent. It's not just the items that are mentioned here, which are perhaps the more obvious, but even a greater uh, array of information. So that's sort of the integration. The new authorization of the T21, the new transportation bill, in a couple of the proposals suggests that we have two or three detailed uh, um, deployments of this. And essentially, we'll see whether that ends up. It's not in the administration's proposal. It may pop up in the center of the house. It's certainly in ITS America's proposal. All right, the next area, this advanced crash avoidance technologies. Here, an array of technologies, basically the in-vehicle and infrastructure systems are cooperating. Uh, you've seen them in the radar systems or the, the smart cruise control, intelligent cruise control, where you're approaching you can, the systems that are, that are available today, you've probably seen those. There are options on certain types of vehicles. And there's a sweeping radar that's mounted on the hood of the vehicle, and basically you can set your cruise control to a certain number of vehicle gaps in the vehicle in front of you. There may not be a vehicle in front of you, just say that it's, it's 3G, let's just say that. So you want to be three vehicles behind the vehicle in front. You also set the speed at the speed limit, obviously, and off you go. A vehicle turns in front of you, then automatically your cruise control adjusts your speed to keep that 3G, three gaps in front of you. And then when that vehicle moves out of the way, it then accelerates back up to that same pre-established position. Those exist. Also, uh, there are technologies that exist, as you know, about uh, side approachment, uh, sometimes vehicles are in your blind spot in your side window, but sensors can provide you information that tells you that there's a vehicle there, so don't pull over. Or if you try to pull over and turn the steering wheel, a, a warning goes off. Eaton has systems that they've used on commercial vehicles. Same with backup systems and the like. If a vehicle's approaching you from the rear, other types of systems suggest that, the vehicle, that your vehicle then could accelerate if there's no one in front is allowed so that you keep a gap from the vehicle that's approaching from the rear, all sorts of systems. So that's what we're talking about here is the, the interrelationship. The automatic crash and incident detection, notification, and response. What a wonderful array of technological opportunities here. Um, you know about the ones already where if an airbag is deployed in some systems, a signal is sent out and in location through GPS and so forth 
tells you and it, it notifies the local or the closest EMS or first responders and they come to the scene. There are others, what we're suggesting now is through telemedicine and other. Wouldn't it be great if the first responders had some idea about the severity of the accident? Of course, it's serious enough if an airbag deploys, but what about more information? What if there was able to suggest more about the, the condition of the individuals inside the vehicle as they were responding so that they had more time or be ready upon arriving at the scene of the accident to, to move quickly into first treatment? That's the notion that in the way we're heading now. Um, NHTSA, which is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and Jeff Runge, who is the administrator, is, is very much interested and very supportive of looking at this whole concept of trying to provide uh, advanced medical treatment and be able to provide the first responders with more information. So we see that as a real opportunity in, in addition to the others that are, that are mentioned here. In terms of advanced transportation management, we're into that now. We have system management activities underway through our traffic control centers, and obviously that's working really well. There's a lot of regional co coordination. There's handoffs now from center to center, particularly uh, metropolitan areas. We have some centers, like in, in, in uh, Texas, that extend hundreds of miles down to the border. So in, there's a handshake going on as trucks cross the border now uh, hundreds of miles before they reach San Antonio. So there's a lot of that coordination and interface that's taking place under systems managers. So you're going to see more and more of that take place. The automated systems, we've had autom the capability of running automated systems now for a long time. That's not new. It's expensive, but we can do it. Many of you remember or perhaps recall the, autom uh, the automated highway demonstration that took place in on Interstate 15 in the HOV lanes in San Diego, 95, I believe, is it 95, 97? Anyway, time flies, but we proved then that we could have uh, driverless vehicles operating in platoons and so forth and so on. We did have operators there, but they didn't, they were there just to watch the gauges and so forth. We even thought that we ought to put a dog in there with the operator, so if the operator tried to touch anything, the dog would bite the <laughs> operator's hand. But the whole notion of, of that capability is there. We're not particularly ready to accept it. There are a lot of issues, uh, tort liability notwithstanding. But the whole notion is that their automated systems are capable. If some of you may have seen a recent article in The Economist where it talked about the pilotless aircraft. Of course, we all know about drones and so forth. We're talking about a commercial aircraft with a thousand people on board. I'm not so sure we're ready to take on board that, that notion of a pilotless aircraft, uh, commercial aircraft yet. Technology's there to accommodate that. And so you'll be interested to, to watch those events as they go across. I will suggest to you that this is a very controversial area within Congress, very controversial. And the, part of the notion is that this is corporate welfare, that in fact putting public money into helping our industry advance these systems are not in the not always in the public interest, but fortunately it's not uh, that really hurt the automated highway system demonstration project when it when it developed and the homeland security uh, you know as much about the activities that are going on on there there's probably be more in the future. turns out that i t s technology and all the management centers and so forth are natural uh, for looking at, uh, at various security related impacts or in fact uh, an incident response for directing either traffic in and around an area, out of an area, just like we do for other emergency natural disasters. So in essence we see ITS uh, playing a major role, very popular within Congress by the way. And they see ITS uh, It's another argument for ITS, and we, we think that we're operating in good shape there. Now, switching to some of the enabling ones, and as you remember, these are the cross-cutting activities that we talked about, this cultural change. Uh, the notion of ITS that it ha is, is that it has to be customer-driven. For a long time, we were trying to push the market. 
with trying to demonstrate what the capability and the interest might be it just doesn't work. You can sort of wet one's appetite through marketing and other plays, but until it is customer driven or the market pulls the technology, you really can't advance it. You are seeing technologies now in, in vehicles that before were options or were toys. There are more telematics and more of these options taking place in Europe and in Asia than in the U.S. primary reason for that, of course, is tort liability issues. There's a real concern within our private sector it's about t being too much out in the forefront and too much risk and exposure until we have a better understanding of what our laws are. So there is a proposal uh, that has been offered to, uh, Hopefully it will show up in the reauthorization that would call for a study of both the European experiences and the Asian experiences and try to begin to move us in the direction of more comfort and less risk for some of these technologies. So we'll see how that plays out. That's going to be a very difficult one, as you can imagine. But it does put a damper on the enthusiasm of, of say, the automobile manufacturers in putting too much uh, equipment out there until we better understand it. And probably dampen enthusiasm is not all bad until we better understand the human factors and the interface relationships. The others, uh, are multidisciplinary, more than ever before, we know it's got to be a team approach of a variety of disciplines that's going to make this work. And that's what, what's another aspect of that I find really very exciting. The cross-modal and cross-jurisdictional cooperation is even more important. It's not within a metropolitan area. It's got to recognize interfaces with, say, rural, suburban, urban, and the like. And it's going to involve all levels of government, even more complex than before. Data security is obviously uh, an issue that's been in front of us all the time. And all of the Big Brother-related issues associated with that. Uh, it's certainly important to the private sector. And then uh, the response to incidents or crisis, all of that changes the way in which we do business. Now, the public sector roles and the relationships and funding are also changing and evolving. The state DOTs today are not, are not going to be the same tomorrow. They're all changing. They're evolving. The variety of disciplines. Those of us who have been around a while look back at the state DOTs and see how dramatically they have changed in the past. We haven't seen anything yet. It's going to be a dramatic change in the future. All the sort of cultural things we talked about before, but these relationships as well. There are more and more owners of infrastructure out there than ever before, and not just government. We're seeing some quasi-operations coming out with toll roads or privately owned uh, or privately invested facilities. Those relationships are, are causing more of a, a collaborative en environment between transportation and non-transportation agencies. Um, there's rarely an event today that doesn't, does not have venture capitals involved in the meetings. We're seeing in our transportation forums more and more economists, one-arm, two-arm <laughs> economists, but in fact we're seeing more of them in venture capitals because we cannot expect to do some of the things that we're talking about doing without a better understanding of how that, that works together. And some of the, what we call innovative financing, that's anything and everything. And the notion of congestion pricing or road pricing and using, uh, watching the experiment that's going on in London, and I'm sure that you've probably heard about that, and watching that unfold, we have the technology to do that. The short-term results from the London experience suggest that it's a huge success, even more above than what was expected to be. It's interesting, just, just before it started, I had the opportunity to visit with the, um, see if I can get this title right, the Right Honorable uh, Minister of, of Transport for the UK. And I asked him what he thought about this experiment. And he paused for a moment, young, young fellow Blair's pointing, and, and then said, well, we're watching it with great interest. And if it is a success, we'll take credit. And if it's a failure, uh, the mayor of London has a real problem. So, <laughs> so that's the attitude. But we think it works, right? We do believe that road pricing works. We have all the technology. It is a massive data integration issue, right? 
we can we know time of day location vehicle weight all of that can be integrated together collected and you get a bill at the end of the month which basically summarize your cost no fuel taxes no other registration fees but that's the bill you get we know that we're headed there but to get there it's going to be a wild and interesting ride. <laughs> Deploy ITS systems on all public, publicly owned fleets. Why not do that? Why not start that right away? That's one way to help pull and demonstrate the technology. So that's the public sector is in for some real interesting uh, changes over the in, the in the future. Federal policies and initiatives to achieve private sector product development. This administration, and I think you, from now on, you're going to see more and more administrations interesting and seeing what they can do to promote private sector investment in the transportation system, new, these new business opportunities and models. You, you will see that <clears throat> while public sector is really important, but the public sector is going to be changing to look at policies and programs and more of the delivery and more of the initiatives will be private sector driven. So that's part of the change that you'll probably see within some of the state DOTs, local governments and the like. Some are further ahead than others. In their experiences now, the U.S. is probably, probably in the in the midst of uh, just beginning to see more of a change. There are cities like Indianapolis and others that do more outsourcing of the transportation services and programs. In the DOTs, we outsource all of our construction now for the most part. We're outsourcing more and more of our maintenance and design and planning. You'll see that continue, and that's what they're talking about here. They're looking for the private sector to be more innovative, if not creative. They want to private sector to be a partner in all of this development, and they are partnering now in the new toll roads and, and the TIFIA and the other types of programs that are under Garvey Bonds, and to be looking at them as being providers of not only the infrastructure, but of the mobility systems themselves. So the private sector, and you'll see the change that's taking place within the engineering firms. We all, uh, again, it's the same change that's taking place in, in government Industry is responding, and the consulting, let's say the engineering planning firms, are changing as well. They have virtually all of them have new ventures and new profit centers that deal with opportunities as they're beginning to emerge. Very interesting to see that unfold. And the government, they're encouraging the customer acceptance. They're supposed to be helping to bring that market into fruition, if you will, removing the barriers to deployment and then to provide user and customer funding funding incentives so that you will see more incentives being provided along the way. And we are looking at what's happened abroad. That's very important so that we don't have to reinvent it. There are a lot of rather interesting business models or opportunities, not always the same cultural-wise, of course, in the climate and government and private sector relationships, not the same. But the business models, there's, there's some interesting interesting things there. It's been real hard in, in t for the traditional government sector to understand that when they enter into a partnership relationship with the private sector and they're helping this private sector, the private sector, they're coming together in a partnership, you know that profit's not a bad word. And in essence, it's very difficult. It seems like a trite statement to make, but it's true that when you enter into a partnership like that, the public sector is helping this private sector partner make a profit. And likewise, they're bringing something to the program as well to help government achieve its responsibilities. But profit has often been, been difficult. It's like outsourcing engineering services. You're going to outsource engineering services. Well, don't we have to pay more for those services than if we used our own sources? It's a very difficult situation to overcome. Human factors area, understanding the basic driver behavior. How do you interface with technology? Uh, every time there's something new that comes out, how do you respond to it? How do you, oh my gosh, I've got to go down. I've got to program this thing. I have to understand uh, all the ins and outs of it. It's getting much, much more challenging, but much easier. Abilities of commercial, public transit, and public safety operators, and the whole notion of of human factors and you can go through uh, all the other workload issues and resolution, the host of embracing technology. We don't know a great deal about that. Again, NHTSA, Federal Highway, and some of the private uh, labs and uh, public labs, national labs are interested in that. 
stakeholder roles, and indeed uh, the range of stakeholders that are possible in here, manage public infrastructure, ensure transportation and system serves the widest possible constituency, minimize impact on the environment, foster a robust and productive private industry. Private sector's responsibility to be an innovator in providing goods and services to business, to government, to consumers. And then lastly, the university's role. And as you think back through what we've talked about in this 10-year plan, the role of the university is very important. One, uh, the nature of the expertise that's required upon entering the market today and understanding the new transportation environment is much different than what it used to be. It was much, much different than, than what I experienced when I went through the um, graduate program, and it's certainly going to be much different today. Um, many of us have dual appointments. I don't know if Rob mentioned it, but in addition to civil engineering, I also have a joint appointment in public affairs because that's public policy. And we need to have people who understand transportation involved in the full range of new initiatives that's, that's coming underway. So there's training, there's education, and there's research, and there's a very important and decisive role for the universities. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Let me just share with you that the progress thus far of taking this plan and putting it into uh, the reauthorization posture, the reauthorization of T21, or the next highway bill. And as you, many of you know, the, when I say highway, transportation bill, the transportation bill that we currently operate on that funds transportation research, funds all the infrastructure, provides all the federal money, expires on September 30th, or the end of September. One October, a new day begins, and we need to have a new bill in place. And we're looking at a substantial increase in funding. Uh, there is still a discussion that's going on with respect to how much funding should be made available for the various programs. There will be some interesting changes that will come out of the reauthorization, and I talked at some length about, about this yesterday, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that anyone might have. We expect to have more money for, for transportation research and development in a variety of ways. There'll be a, a reauthorization or a new look, if you will, at university research initiatives, the, the sort of university transportation centers program. Um, it's, it's all the Senate, the House, and the administration proposal will all have a university transportation centers program in that, which is an opportunity, I think, for Portland State, and I don't know whether you're currently uh, working on that or not. Uh, the House version will recommend that uh, um, that the funding go from a million dollars up to four million dollars for uh, one center per state, uh, not more than one center per state. So they're looking at collaborative efforts and opportunities that all should be merit-based, competitively awarded, uh, which means no earmarking and the like. Now that's going to be fun to watch and see how that earmarking or designating the flow of funds, which usually avoid uh, the, the open competition for the award. So we'll see how all that plays out. Calls for strengthening the surface uh, planning and research monies, the SPR funds that we know about, that will be increased. There strongly supports the National Cooperative Higher Research Program, which is another source of funding. The Transit Cooperative Research Program will, can, will get a boost as well. There's some notion about creating a surface transportation planning and environment research program. Unfortunately, uh, there was a study done, um, chaired by Betty Deacon from Berkeley, that called for that program to be a $150 million cooperative research program. Um, there's no money in the, in the bill at this particular time in the administration's bill but something on the order of $25 million is likely to be proposed, and it may be funded out of, uh, out of NCHR. I'm pretty not sure how that might work. There will be uh, a, a uh, future strategic highway research program that is offered 
to be funded at, at, uh, uh, on the notion of $75 million per year uh, for the, over the six-year period that will fund four major thrust areas. One is safety, uh, one is more in the operations area, one will be uh, more in the notion of new materials, reconstruction of the existing facilities, the notion of get in, get out, and stay out when you're rebuilding and rehabilitating the infrastructure and the like. So those are some of the types of programs that are likely to show up in the planning, uh, in the planning and research arena, particularly in the research. So we're hoping that the reauthorization will have a rich array of opportunities for university research and for students and continuing the student fellowship programs that, that exist today. So if I, I might, if I'd stop and then see if uh, there are any questions or any comments that you might like to make. Yes? Um, my question is just the, this ITS program plan, is it only focusing on road projects or is there any initiatives for other modes? A very good question about whether this is multimodal or whether it's particularly highways. No, it is, it is indeed multimodal surface transportation. Does not address air, and it does does not address for the for the most part uh, marine or ocean going or waterway transport. But it focuses on on uh, surface, particularly highways, transit, rail systems, and the like. Yes. Uh, okay, I have a question about the uh, you know, the technology using. You mentioned something about the, the trucks, maybe a beat alarm going off if there's somebody in your blind spot. Yes. Trying to uh, all the technology, trying to avoid cars from running into each other, you know, following too closely or whatever. And so I'm, this question is related to risk, uh, uh, in a, of making the investment in such things. You mentioned that that maybe the private sector is reluctant still, um, but you also mentioned that one of the things we could do is get all public uh, sector vehicles. Uh, put this stuff on there, and I'm curious if uh, you know if it won't be the public sector pay pays the high prices in the beginning uh, for a product that fails. Um, so what what kind of and someone I was trying to think of well what one public sector that might have used some similar technology and I thought maybe the military might be using some similar technology to prevent them from shooting each other or like tanks you know like. Mm -hmm. To all, every tank has something, and so, hey, that's one of our tanks. Or, mm -hmm. Is there any examples where a public sector has used the technology and it's working to, to take away the risk from other public sectors trying to implement? Most of the technologies that I was talking about are already in operation, and many of them are in private fleets today. For example, the use of AVI, automatic vehicle identification, AVL systems coupled together with, to a certain extent, GIS systems are already in place. And in essence, the, the issue is how do you provide the opportunity for others to invest in it in a more economical fashion so you have to grow the market so that you can drop, drop the price. In the commercial freight sector, for example, um, there are high-end delivery systems, commercial trucks, that, that know exactly uh, or are predicated on just-in-time delivery. In fact, it's not just-in-time, it's exactly on time. And in fact, though they pay a premium for that price. It's essentially the truckload carriers that are operating across country. And in fact, they will guarantee delivery within a 15-minute window from Boston to L.A. I mean, that's how precise they are. But it's just like FedEx or other systems where you can track that delivery. They know exactly where it is. You can check on it any time and find out where it is. But, you know, you pay a premium for that, and that cost is being passed on uh, to the consumer, whoever that might be, the shipper and the like. What we, uh, what we need to do is to promote a faster deployment of those. So one option and one of, one of the incentives that's being prepared is to provide a tax-based incentive to those who, fleet owners, uh, and I realize government doesn't pay this, but for fleet owners that would uh, acquire the systems and put them on board that might provide for enhanced safety and the like. There is a, an excise tax that's paid on new vehicles, and, and it, there's some notion about providing them an exclusion from having to pay that tax, a 12% reduction of an excise tax on that equipment if they were uh, 
it's like giving a tax credit, if you will, if they purchase. We've done that for other industries, and there's some notion about trying to do that. The notion of having the private sector buy in, and it's not, I mean, you, 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 there's a whole notion of how you make this work, and you're suggesting that the public sector may have to pay a premium price, and then those who follow have less of a price. It's a very important issue. But hopefully the, the idea that we can work with that so that indeed the public sector is not having to be the guinea pig, but if you, if you could get several publics together and they would place an order, it's just like buying buses today or any transit vehicle. You know, we don't do it as a single property. You usually get together with others and you buy, you place an order for a quantity and you get that discount. Hopefully it's that type of incentive operation that we would allow to go forward. But it's you know it's it's difficult right now. Uh, so could just if I follow up, just uh, so what are one or two uh, advantages to say like all the municipalities in Oregon uh, bounding together and getting uh, some parts of a particular technology? What would the advantage be to that government? Well, it perhaps would have a, a price savings if they were gathered together and do a group purchase, which is the idea of transit properties going here. They spec out a common vehicle and then they, they put in an order for, instead of 10, they put in an order for 600 or 700. It's that type of analogy. The other approach is that it, if, the, if the issue on technology happens to be safety related or maybe it's the backing up device or something, then that's, they should spec out for safety reasons. It, it's got to make sense to them. You're not talking about just putting something on, on board that would not provide a value. Uh, to them, but there are a whole host of those technologies that, that might be useful in that regard. We're going through that now as we're retrofitting vehicles for other types of alternate fuels. And, the, and again, we're using the same model. Let's let the public sector be the driver for that, and hopefully once they've demonstrated that there's a market there, others will follow. I think that's probably the analogy that's being proposed. Yes, sir. No. So. Um, it's, there's a lot of technology out there, and I think it's great. And uh, but I, I guess my my question is: is what is the purpose of public sectors spending large amounts of money on intelligent transportation programs that the public is not ready for? Well, I think that's the nature of the whole discussion. And in fact, if it's not a value, if it's not something that the public sector is at all interested in, I assume you're talking about government. Yes. Yeah. If government cannot uh, we're not suggesting that they buy something that's not going to be of value to them. No one would propose that. But the notion is that some of these are safety enhance and safety enhancements. And in fact, if there's a concern, and this might serve to help offset part of that experience or adverse experience that they're having, then it makes sense to try and bring that on board. But if it doesn't make sense, don't do it. I mean, it's like the in-vehicle guidance systems. Does public sector uh, local government fleets need these in-vehicle guidance systems, these vehicle displays, the map displays, and probably not, probably not. But that's being driven to a large extent by the, the rental fleets today, and in fact those systems are finding themselves in all the upper end vehicles. It's a standard on many of them and options on others. So you have to find the right technologies that, that make sense. The analogy I was talking about before, if there's a safety-related problem that you're having and if there's a technology that might help address that, a good example, I think, at least on some of the government fleets, is AVL, Automatic Vehicle Location. Sometimes you want to know where those vehicles are. You have it on your transit vehicles, but you might have them on other vehicles like uh, uh, various utility vehicles. More government fleets now are acquiring that AVL to know where their vehicles are located. Yes, sir. Assuming that the ITS program gets implemented, um, I would think that then freight and personnel transport would be a little more streamlined, a little more efficient. And you mentioned a couple questions ago that uh, airlines aren't considered in any of the ITS, that there's no air transport considered. If it's more efficient to transport goods on the grounds, there will probably be cuts in demand for air travel and air freight movement. Considering we continue to bail out airlines, um, with congressional money, is there 
any one federally that you guys would be working with to explain you should expect some decrease in demand. So don't necessarily bail out the airlines. It's more their responsibility to operate more efficiently as a business. Well, that's a good question. But when you look at the freight that actually is being moved, there are two different markets. And in fact, uh, there, while this particular plan did not, not address air, it does address the interface. In fact, some of the technologies that are proposed within the details of this that are proposed for the freight are in fact knowing more about what what is in a box, what is in a container and the like. But the nature of those commodities that move by air, move by highway, are traditionally substantially different. And so consequently there's less competition there than you than you would, might imagine. In fact there's less competition between rail and truck than you than you might imagine until we get our, our rail system oriented in, in a different fashion, which is probably going, going to shake out. But your notion about looking at, at how across the board impacts is absolutely important. One example, uh, Chairman Young, uh, uh, Don Young is the chairman of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, he is, in fact, uh, in, in responsible for bringing the reauthorization bill through the, the House. He's from Alaska. He believes strongly in dedicated truck facilities, truck lanes. He wants truck lanes. As far as I know, there are not too many trucks moving around in Alaska from location to location, but he feels that it's in the national interest that we begin to look at how we can accommodate truck movement, recognizing that there is rail uh, available, perhaps not uh, in all locations where we want it. So he, he believes strongly that they ought to have dedicated truck facilities. The railroads are very much interested in many of the rails. And you know there are only about seven Class I railroads today in the United States. And I was reminded, um, I served in the Office of the Secretary of USDOT in the early 70s. There were about 48 Class I railroads then. Someone reminded me of now. We have seven now. There are actually only four that really make up the major railroad. So when they hold uh, a conference. No longer do they have to have a room like this. They get on a conference call among the four CEOs and they can decide how what the policy should be. It's really interesting. You can't do that with trucking companies where there are hundreds, if not thousands. And with airlines, it's you know sooner or later it might be the same way. But uh, the notion is that the railroads now, at least three of the major four, are interested in public funds being invested in the infrastructure. So instead of expanding I don't, I'm not familiar about the rail network out here. I'm going to go east. In Virginia, Washington, D.C. area, there is Interstate 81. It's a highly congested truck route. Moves north and south, a lot of truck freight. There is a parallel rail. The, the Secretary of the Treasury, formerly the head of the uh, CEO of CSX, had proposed that instead of expanding Interstate 81 to build a dedicated truck lane or expand, why don't we expand, use public money, the same money that we would use over here, put it over here and expand the railroad system so they could carry more of the containerized freight and take more trucks off of the highway off freight. fact was that it's probably not, it's not a one-for-one -one shift because it's not the same commodities. And then you have to look, start looking at the so whole system-wide impact. So you're right in the sense that you have to look at across the board the whole system-wide aspects to see what the trade-offs are and what the influences might be. And while this charges at a, a, a major part of it, it doesn't deal with ports, doesn't deal with marine transport or global trade. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering how you um, had balanced personal privacy issues with the five goal statements that you mentioned. I know it seems maybe a little far-fetched, but I'm, I'm envisioning that in five years we all have transponders in our cars, and I drive every day down 217, and pretty soon I'm getting um, emails for ads from restaurants alongside the road because they know I'm driving by. But I'm just wondering, and, and also if you could maybe talk a little more about, um, along the same line, the issue of having maybe medical information. You talked about safety and, and quick response and giving them the most information. Is that something you see happening soon? The whole notion of personal privacy is it's a huge issue and it's discussed great and it's one which we know very little about or, or, or not prepared 
to address. But you know, it's becoming less, in some ways it's becoming more accepted. We're accepting more, uh, um, more knowledge about us of others. I mean, we worry about our social security number, we worry about people accessing our files and all that, but in many ways there's already a great deal of information out there about us and we seem to be allowing ourselves to be more susceptible to providing information. We sign up for different cards, we sign up for all sorts of systems, we allow our email address to go. So I guess what I'm suggesting, while there's a major concern, we're inching that way. And as we talk about uh, uh, the whole notion of doing road pricing, you were on a particular road, you know, you, you were charged this much for being on this road at this time of day. Well, the telephone bill already gives you all your long distance calls for a large extent or your cell phone bill. So we're allowing others to have, and even if it's not a bill, they know it. I mean, and, uh, they access it if they need to. I guess what concerns us, are, and another, another point, is that there's an AVI on every vehicle that's manufactured today. There's a tag, electronic tag, that's on every vehicle that goes through. In fact, GM has a little black box now, you may know about, that records the last few seconds of a crash. Uh, but, so they know a lot more about, or will know a lot more. But that AVI on board is typically used for the manufacturing process. So instead of keeping hard paper records of, of the vehicle's manufacturing as it goes through the production process, this stage on this day, and they did these following. It's being recorded to a certain extent, or that's being interacted and put into an electronic file. But then after, and then it's kept, it's controlled when it gets into the yard for theft and for other things. But then it's discarded. It's not used anymore. So in essence, it's, it's not a big step to go the next step and say, okay, there will be an AVI that will be on board every car, and you use it for your toll tag, and you'll use it for other this road pricing scheme that we were talking about down the road. And yeah, then how far do you go before they been bombard you with all sorts of information, or you'll be identified that you're traveling this route, so you will get emails about we're having a special, and you need to stop and take advantage of it. We don't know where this is going. While there's a lot of discussion about what the opportunity is, but this is kind of the suggestion that you know, we know there's going to be a dramatic change. We know this is going to open up a whole host of ideas, most of which we have no idea. And remember 9-11. We did not ever think that we'd be using our uh, traffic management centers for directing traffic and allowing the first responders' priority to get into the system and blocking off other. We never thought of it being used in that fashion. But we put it into operation just like that in Washington and New York. So I'm, I guess we're suggesting that there are going to be a lot of these we're going to have to deal with. I don't, I don't pretend to know what those would be or the answers, but you can expect that it's going to be a great deal of information. As far as the medical information being readily available, I think you know, that's, that's the notion of going back to telemedicine, about having the medical records that can be interrogated as the first responders are on the way to you. That's wonderful. I mean, I would be delighted to have that on board now. And the vehicles that... Uh, that at least I buy f for my family have all that sorts of devices on it um, in terms of being the OnStar or the types of systems that uh, where you can have that interaction in addition to the cell phone capability. So I think you're beginning to see more and more people. You know that OnStar device was not a success when it was officially, officially introduced. GM was struggling. Here was an idea where years ago they decided that they were going to build all of their platform vehicles with all the electronic hardware to do in vehicle navigation systems, AVIs, communication. They just wired all the vehicles, even though they knew it was going to be a small percentage of vehicles that would take. And then they started going into the first offering, one among the first offerings was OnStar. And, you know, they had one service, and then I, now I think they have three levels of service or something like that. But they're using, they're not using it, they believe, in a smart way yet. But they're trying to test the market and see what people will accept and what they'll buy. And it's beginning to move forward. It changed GM's uh, uh, corporate management's view of ITS. It absolutely did. Now they are 100% sold, not necessarily on OnStar, but on ITS and all the telematics opportunities. So telemedicine, I think, is a wonderful way to go. I'm excited about it. Yes, sir. I'm wondering if the 
If the 10-year vision is realized in the area of truck size and weight regulation and enforcement, what kind of future will that be compared to what we see today? Well, the, the vision does not necessarily speak to uh, specifics on, on what truck size and weight policy should be in the U.S., but there, there is a study that was done and, um, and a report mandated by Congress that to, that's now have been delivered on what the national policy should be. And it calls for uh, some experiments uh, with respect to size and weights. The whole notion with uh, the technology obviously leads one to begin to believe that you can be, you can start increasing it. We can't, as you know, we can't go up and we can't go out. We can only go longer and the various controls associated with that. We, we uh, uh, as you have here in Oregon, you've got smart way stations now and technology that can do a lot of screening and checking of vehicles while they go by in the main lanes. Um, it's checking, it n doesn't necessarily check the driver yet, so there will be a lot of those technologies where you, with the, the smart license, uh, driver's license, the CDL commercial driver's license, and also checking out the trailers. The trailers will have tags on them in the future. And then inside will be the manifest because the security people in the future are going to want to know what's in, in those trucks. So I suspect that truck size and weights will continue to be an issue and continue to creep forward. There's notion about dedicated facilities um, and it, that'll those will probably, you'll start seeing, like HOVs, you'll start seeing some dedicated facilities or shared facilities for certain types of vehicles, including these longer trucks. So I, uh, there will not be a missed opportunity. The new head of the American Trucking Association is the former governor of Kansas. He's a very good friend of the president's, and he's already been to OMB. He's only been on the job um, in a short period of time, a couple of months or so. And he's already picked up that report and is pushing it to try and get something done with truck size and weights in this uh, new bill. The new bill, the administration's bill on reauthorization is silent with respect to truck size and weights. The notion is, you know, kick a sleeping dog. If it's controversial, we don't need it at this point in time. But I suspect that there will be some discussion in the Senate or the House before it's all over. But yeah, but with ITS technology, we're doing more to the trucks and we're probably re requiring them more. And there's a shakeout going on in the trucking industry. It's not just the airline fleet that's at the margin. You know, the trucking companies are at the margin, the rail companies are at the margin. Our whole transportation industry is operating at a very thin margin right now and they're all susceptible to change. There's some very profitable individual firms and they'll take advantage of this, this market situation. Lloyd? One of the early yeah. uh, experiments with public-private uh, partnerships was on, in trucking, and the HELP project is one of them. And uh, at first, it just sort of kick-started. It was a public uh, research project. But it, uh, as, as you know, because you were involved in it from the beginning, it was metamorphosed into, uh, into <coughs> an operational uh, system using um, a contractual relationship with Lockheed. And uh, I just thought maybe that would be a good example, uh, uh, m one kind of model that's out there that you might uh, talk about just a little bit, and there, the success of it, and where that's uh, where that maybe you see it going in the future. What Lloyd is talking about was uh, the notion that uh, uh, years ago, in fact, Lloyd brings it, he was one of the instigators with ODOT being the leaders in, in setting this up along with Arizona DOT and another individual. Those two had the foresight to recognize 15 years ago that there was technology occurring like AVI, AVL, way in motion equipment or the scales inside the main lanes. And, and more importantly I suspect was that you could do a systems integration of all that data and information and you could continue to move freight quickly while still making serving all the administrative and regulatory rules and requirements and helping the trucking companies move more freely the freight, therefore hopefully reducing the cost of freight goods and also then targeting your enforcement on those trucks or carriers that, uh, that could be found 
more easily electronically and not meeting the requirements. That model started out as an R&D project to test whether AVI would work under certain conditions, and there are a lot of technical issues. Where should the antenna be? How do you, how do you deal with a truck that's changing lanes with scales and with AVI readers and detect all these sort of interesting and complex issues? That was an R&D project. Well, in about 95, after a decade or more of going through the extended R&D program, which was done with pool-funded money, both from the state DOTs, and they had... Uh, perhaps at one point is over two dozen states participating, pooling resources to do this R&D effort and instrumenting certain highways and testing it. They create a business model. This is an example, I think uh, Lloyd was suggesting, share that a business model, they did a study and they found out a lot of interesting things, what the role of government should be and what the role of the private sector should be. And they had a board of directors one public, one private from each of the individual states. And they created a not-for-profit organization in the state of Arizona and then came together to this corporate enterprise. And it was interesting to see how they struggled with how they were going to do the management and then what service were they going to, to offer and how did they go about entering and deploying this service. They did a market study and found out that we'll take the, the lowest hanging fruit, and that's electronic preclearance of trucks, the Woodburn say, for example, an I-5, where you can check credentials, the same thing that we were just talking about a moment ago. Pick that out, and let's set up a, let's outsource that activity to, uh, from the state, let's say the state of Oregon, uh, to this uh, enterprise, uh, which was known as HELP, Inc., Heavy Vehicle Electronic License Plate Incorporated, HELP, Inc., some liberty there with the spelling and an acronym. But they set up that, and they, f they went out with an RFP and hired someone to come in and be the franchise holder. In other words, enter into the deployment of that. Lockheed Martin was awarded the franchise agreement. Interesting enough, as a satellite, the Secretary of, current Secretary of Transportation was the head of that enterprise at Lockheed. The Deputy of Secre Secretary was the number two guy at Lockheed for this exercise. So it's kind of an interesting sideline. They're now working together in a different venue. But anyway, that enterprise entered into uh, working out a memorandum of understanding with individual states to, so that they could, in essence, begin to privatize, but that's not just sake of discussion, way stations under a, under a collaborative agreement. The fee for that service, Lockheed Martin would come in and deploy the equipment, the in-motion scales, or work with the government and working out what, who would be responsible for what. But in essence, the industry would pay a fee for every time they use the service. So if they're coming down and they had to pre-qualify and all that sort of thing. But the business model is that there's a first cost sunk investment that Lockheed Martin would make on the basis of entering into an operating fee arrangement so that every time the vehicles that were equipped with transponders and so forth passed, were given clearance to go by a way station, or given a green light, if you will, inside the cab, continue on, then they would be charged a fee for that service. It's like a toll service. That business model is beginning to pay off. It's been a long time coming, but that's the type of new creative ideas that need to take place. And it's not easy to get a highway patrol officer to agree that they're going to let this truck continuing to go by, even though there's been, they've been checked and they're certified in advance that they're a good curve. But you can imagine, they want to look in that driver's eyes and they want to do all sorts of checking, but it's uh, difficult. But that business model is beginning to work. So that's just one example. Rob? We do have a couple of email questions, speaking of technology. But, good, uh, good. The, the first one is just a suggestion for the new name for the Oh, good. Well. Which maybe this is appropriate for a university. The acronym would be uh, Seamless Integrated Transportation Information Network, or SIT IN. <laughs> SIT IN. Yeah. So. Good. Thank you. I appreciate and that a, recommendation. A, and the, the question is um, Is there a danger in more reliance on the, on the private sector, given that government most of the time doesn't go out of business? But we've seen some examples in toll authorities, for example, in Orange County, where the governmental agency has acquired the facility from the private sector. Are there protections built in? I, th I think that's a, 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 another example of experience that we'll, we'll have to live through and test. 
it's difficult to say what the occurrence is likely to be, but in essence, I suspect that uh, um, we try to look at all the instances or all the circumstances, and even in the Orange County case, there was a provision that upon failure. So that was, they knew in advance, or they built in a, uh, um, a process that will allow them to respond to that particular situation. All we can do is try to plan for the for the various alternatives that would take take place. That's the best approach to that. And yes, sir, you had one red shirt. Oh, yeah. I was, I've heard in the past of a national ITS architecture. I'm just curious what exactly it means and what the biggest challenges to achieving it. Yeah, the national architecture is something that is that was established through uh, an elaborate uh, contractual arrangement through the U.S. Uh, DOT. Uh, in conjunction with ITS America and some other entities, and that's an ongoing process, by the way. But the architecture is defined in such a way that everyone will have the same vision of where we were headed and what the interface uh, requirements or, or, or uh, uh, procedures might be. It continues to, to evolve and to change. It's an ongoing process, and what we're, and as we learn more and as new opportunities are identified, and that that is altered as well. I mean, it's more than just the U.S. ITS architectural plan. We're also working in concert with the International Standards Organization, or ISO, and their range of committees that also deal with ITS because truly we are interested in being able to have a commonality, particularly in expectations between, say, the European systems, the U.S. systems, and the Asian systems. We all have a vested interest in... in driver expectation and human expectation and interface because more and more of us uh, will be operating internationally and just as you would go from one state to the other state you'd like to have common expectations and that's what we're hoping to do there with the systems architect and we want to keep it open so that there is in fact competition global competition not just uh, competition open so we're trying to stay away from proprietary systems if indeed we can and and to allow for competition in all areas. Yes, ma'am. Um, are there regions in the country that ITS America is aware of or is supporting maybe um, to use AVI, AVL in an anonymous fashion to be tracking travel patterns and in order to provide information for transportation planning? And actually, a second just sideline question I have is um, with the slow but steady growth of like hybrid vehicles, what kind of power requirements do, like, if you had the, you know, on-hood radar, um, if you had, like, basically all the safety and navigational um, equipment you could have, it, would something like a hybrid vehicle be able to support that? Yeah, and that's a very good question. I, I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. I do know that uh, the power requirements are, are an issue, and I mentioned that GM early on provided the harness and then size the batteries and so forth, the power system to accommodate uh, what might be required to make it work. I think more and more of the auto automobile manufacturers are doing that and they have an expectation of what those requirements are. But surprisingly, the power that's required is actually declining as we learn more about the technology and the interface and those with uh, the ability to use, use electronics more efficiently. That's what I'm told. But I, I don't know. I expect that that'll there's going to be a threshold, and all the vehicles of the future are going to have, have that threshold that they're going to have to match. While it may indeed put more pressure on these alternate fuel vehicles as they emerge, um, it's an absolute requirement because many of them are going to be safety-oriented features that we, we need to have. As far as your first uh, suggestion about where AVI and AVL um, uh, are, in, there are a lot of experiments that are being used in various locations. Um, the one that... Uh, um, that I'm most familiar with is in the Houston area where they have, uh, they've been experimenting with uh, the AVI and the, and the AVL, primarily the AVI. I don't know actually how many AVL systems they have on board. That's an interesting question. I would suggest that perhaps uh, an email to um, Mike Friedis with Federal Highway Administration. He's now the acting uh, director of the, the, the Joint Program Office, ITS Joint Program Office, or Steve Kusiemba of ITS America. He's head of the technology group there, and he they might be able to give you more specific information. That's a that's a good question. 
Yes, sir. Uh, as I understand it, this plan, your vision is a couple years old now. And is there any way, do you have any benchmarks built in for measuring the progress, or will everything be looked at in the end, or can you tell us of any? Yeah, thing? no, that's, that's an excellent point. Number one benchmark is to get this into the reauthorization. So if we're successful there, that'll be the first, first one. You get some of these funded program. It also, the third is within the funding that will be generated uh, and within the, the, the joint program office or however USDOT will ultimately reorganize their ITS activities internally, how many of these will be adopted into priorities. This is a living document. And while I've shared with you, uh, uh, m much of it has not changed. But of course, oh, obviously the Homeland Security has been an added part into that. Um, this is very much at a high vision, goal, theme area. Right behind this, though, there's been a lot of work on infilling with what could be some actual experiments and activities that would advance this. So there's a lot of work that's going on behind that. In terms of how you measure success at the end of that, that's what some of those programs are being uh, 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 design now. While this is, since this has been created, there's been a lot of work trying to backfill and build the foundation for this work. So while this was a bottoms up as well as a tops down, now we're trying to build what could be the research program and the deployment programs for that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, with that, let's extend our appreciation to P Professor Walton. Thank you.